morning. Welcome to Victorious Faith. I'm Cherry Campbell. We're talking about the ministry and the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, actually, we've already covered a lot about the person of the Holy Spirit, his personality, his nature, his characteristics, his his workings. And now we're looking at what is his ministry. And we saw what is his ministry to the sinners. He is to the sinner, a witness And he convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. He is the one who brings conviction to the sinner so that they can repent and so that they can see the light of the truth and um, be saved. And the revelation of righteousness and judgment also, sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then again, yesterday we were also talking about what is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the born again child of God. And we saw that, first of all, he is the one who is the agent or the worker of salvation, the new birth in us. And we saw that in John chapter 22, after Jesus had been risen from the dead, after he was raised from the dead and He ascended into heaven. He told Mary Magdalene in the morning, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to the father, my father, your father, my God, your God. But later in the day, in the evening of the same day, while the disciples were in the upper room with the door closed and locked for fear of the Jews, that Jesus came and stood among them and In verse 21, he said, peace be with you as the father has sent me, I'm sending you. And verse 22, and with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. What was that? That was the new birth. The first thing Jesus did after he went into the father's presence and he brought his blood to the heavenly mercy seat to pour it out and to pay for and and to provide redemption for all mankind and for all sin. He returned to earth again and to his disciples first and foremost. And the first thing he did to them with them is that he immediately. I mean, he didn't say, let's stop and talk and chat for a while. He said, peace. And then he breathed on them. He had to speak peace because they were fearful. So don't be afraid. Peace to you. And immediately, I mean, that shows how important this was. It was top priority. He did not stop and chat with them about the day's events, about the day before, the day before, about what's going on. No, there was no chatting. There was no conversation. There was peace to you. And he breathed on them immediately. And we saw that that relates back to The uh, Genesis chapter two, verse seven, when God breathed into the man, into his nostrils, the breath of life, he spirited into him the spirit of life in the Hebrew. The word for spirit is the same word as the word for breath. It's the word ruach. And in the Greek, it's the same word. It's the word pneuma, spirit and breath, spirit and breath. And as God breathed into Adam, Also, Jesus breathed into the disciples as he breathed into them the breath of life. That was the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them when he said, receive the Holy Spirit. They received new life just as Adam received new life. Also, these disciples received new life because they were alive in the body, but they were spiritually dead. What is spiritual death? Spiritual death is being separated from God because God is life and God is the source of all life. So if you're separated from life, you're dead. And so the spirit man separated from God, the spirit of life, that spirit man is dead. But when you get reconnected and it's like the umbilical cord, and I've talked about this sometimes in the past This umbilical cord, it joined Adam to God before Adam sinned. And then when he sinned, that umbilical cord was cut and he was cut off from God. 
Well, when you're born again, that umbilical cord that connects you to God is reconnected. You then get reconnected by the umbilical cord of life to God, the source of all life. And then you're operating in him. And like Jesus said, God in us, us in God, Jesus said, I'm in the father, the father's in me and you are in me and I'm in you. We become one through that spirit of life. God dwelling in us makes us alive spiritually, alive, spiritually alive. And so we see that that's what Jesus did in John 20, verse 22, when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit, he ministered and breathed the breath of new life into them. And they were immediately born again, born again. As it says in Second Corinthians five seventeen. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The word creation there literally means species. It's another species that doesn't, that didn't exist. So the born again person is a species. We are a different species than the rest of the people in the world that are not born again, that are not saved. That's why in Hebrews 11, it says we're aliens. We're aliens here. We're of a different planet. Yes, the planet heaven. We're from heaven now not from earth. We are aliens on earth. We are a different species. And that's why they don't even understand us. We look different. We sound different. Or you should anyway. If you look like them and talk like them, then you're not acting like a born again Christian. If you are acting like a born again Christian, then you look different and sound different than the world. And so it as back to second Corinthians five seventeen. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new species. The old has gone. The new has come. And what has happened? New life, resurrection life has entered into your spirit when you are born again. Hallelujah. So first of all, the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the child of God is to bring salvation, the new birth. And then secondly, he bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. In Romans 8, 16, Romans 8, 16. Now the NIV says the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Then King James version says that the spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are God's children. So when you're born again, then there is a witness of the Holy Spirit in your spirit. And you know, you are saved. You know, you are saved. If you don't know you are saved, you should, and you can. All you have to do is pray that prayer of salvation by faith. You see, if you were born and raised in a liturgical church that says you're born again when you're a baby, when you get sprinkled with water. That's not true. You are not born again as a baby when you're sprinkled. Sprinkling with water does not save you from sin. Why? Because for one thing, every person must choose for himself. It must be your own personal choice. You see, when a baby is sprinkled, the baby has no choice. It is the parent and the priest who is choosing. You cannot choose for another person to be saved. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. You can never make the choice for another human being to choose they are saved. No. And if a parent could make sure their child was saved, then everybody in the world would be saved. No, it doesn't work that way because God has given to every person a free moral right to choose. That's called free moral agency, meaning you, every person has the right to choose. You cannot choose for anybody else and nobody can make your choice for you. So if it was as a baby, that baby made no choice of his own will. That's number one reason. 
And number two reason is because it is not sprinkling with water that saves you. It is the blood of Jesus that saves you. And that is received by faith because it is spiritual. And that's another thing. Number three, salvation is by faith, not by works. Salvation is by faith, not by works. And the sprinkling with water is a physical work. It is not, it represents to them something spiritual, but it is not a spiritual working of faith. Faith has to be involved. We are saved by grace through faith. And the baby was not exercising either their will and choice or were they exercising their faith. So it must be by faith. And then not only that, but some people maybe not having grown up in the liturgical type of a church, but even evangelical, they grew up in church. And so they think they're saved. But you know, do you know, growing up in church and attending church does not save you. I heard this story. It's a true testimony. And when I was in Bible college and the teachers there shared that pr- prior to the time I had been there, that one time a man came to this Bible school that I attended and went through the Bible school. And after he was in classes for a few days or weeks or maybe even a month or so, he had been a pastor for many years. He retired. He was a retired pastor. So he probably had pastored something like 30 or 40 years. And he was retired. A retired pastor heard about the Bible school and he went to Bible school and he found out he had never been saved. He had been a pastor for years, but never saved himself. Well, if he was never saved, then he didn't know what salvation was. Then he didn't teach anybody in his church about salvation. So how could anybody in his church get saved unless they were getting saved somewhere else? You see, it is possible to go to church your whole life and never get saved. Why? Because the new birth is is your choice. You must pray and ask. You have not because you ask not. And just because you go to church and attend church doesn't mean you ever asked. You need to check up with yourself on that. Have you gone to church your whole life? If you have, do you remember specifically asking Jesus to be your savior? Because if you didn't, or confessing Jesus is your Lord, and and that is the same many times, Lord, I just confess you are my Lord and Savior. That can also work the new birth if it's in faith. If it's in faith. And if you never did that, never asked and confessed, Jesus Christ is my Savior and my Lord. You might have been in church but you're not saved until you say that because that's what the prescription for salvation is. Look at Romans chapter 10, Romans 10. You know, this is what a lot of Christians call the Romans road through the book of Romans. And how do you get saved in Romans 10 verse nine? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And I would say, you need to say, Jesus is my Lord, my Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Verse 10, for it is with your heart that you believe. So it's with your heart. You believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Notice salvation hasn't been completed until there is confession, not confession of sin, although that's important. You see, there are different kinds of confessions. This is not the confession of sin, but this is the confession of Jesus. All right. So you can, you see, confession of sin doesn't save you either. 
Now listen carefully. There are different kinds of confessions. Confession of sin can bring cleansing of that sin, but it is the confession of Jesus that saves you. That's what it says in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And like I said, Jesus Christ is my Lord. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So what is your confession of salvation? Confession for salvation is Jesus Christ. You are my Lord. You are my savior. I confess you. I make you my Lord and savior. I surrender my life to you. I yield myself to you. That means I turn away and repent from sin and I turn to you and I choose you and I take you as my savior, as my Lord. I receive you. I take you by faith as my savior and Lord. That is the confession of salvation. And that is what's required to be born again. Confession of sin alone without confession of Jesus Christ as Lord does not save you. Now you continue to confess your sin after you're saved now, some people think you don't need to, but it's taught in the Bible that the confession of sin brings cleansing from the sin, but the confession of Jesus Christ is Lord is what gives you the new birth. Amen. And so I just wanted to clarify that. I felt like the Holy Spirit was directing me. There are people listening who have been raised in all kinds of churches. I believe, I mean, as this radio program reaches a vast area, we probably have people listening who are um, from all different churches, Methodist, Baptist, Lutheran, Anglican, Catholic, Pentecostal, Church of God, all different kinds of churches. And these have different religious traditions and doctrines. And some of them about salvation are not correct. And that's why I needed to correct what does the Bible clearly teach for salvation. It is not sprinkling with water. It is not attendance at church. And it is not just a frequent saying, oh, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. I mean, that you, you'll understand that when you remember what we taught about the law of faith, and when we talk about the power of words, it's not confessing that you're a sinner, but it's confessing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and you're made righteous by the blood that you are saved and cleansed. So that's it. And, and also it's not attendance in church, like I said, but you must have a point in your life where you absolutely unquestioningly know that you have said that to God, Jesus Christ. I ask you to come into my heart, be my savior, be my Lord. I give you my life. I confess Jesus is my Lord, my savior. Then you are saved. And I hope that every one of you have at some point in your life, unquestioningly, undoubtedly said that to the Lord. That's when you are saved. You are born again. And then when you have prayed that prayer, the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit or testifies with your spirit in Romans eight sixteen that you are God's child. You see, then there is a witness on the inside. You know, you know that you know, and you know that you know that you know you know. Amen. You see, if you don't know that you're saved, then you're probably not because when you are saved, you know it. You know it. There is the witness of the Holy Spirit testifying, confirming that you are God's child. And so you need that witness on the inside of you that you are God's children, God's child. And that is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And then another thing after the new birth, you are sealed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter one, verses 13 and 14, it says, that's Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ 
when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. So notice that when you are born again, when you've believed, it says you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. Now we see that again in Ephesians chapter four, verse 30. Ephesians four thirty says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You were sealed. So you're marked in him with a seal. You are sealed. Now, I believe very strongly that that seal is visible in the spirit realm to God, to the angels, and to the devil and his demons. I believe that the devil can look at a person in the spirit because he sees spirit and natural realm at both at the same time. That he can see a Christian and I mean, see a person and know they're a Christian by the seal. They are marked. I believe that every angel and every demon can look at a person who is a born again Christian. They see the mark, the seal of the Holy Spirit. You are sealed by God, by the Holy Spirit when you're born again, and now you are marked as a child of God. Hallelujah. You know, that mark, it's like a branding of ownership. You know, I mean, sorry to use this example, but the way um, ranchers will brand cattle, cattle get branded. The brand on the cattle marks their ownership. It's a seal of ownership. This cattle, these cattle belong to me. Well, we are branded and sealed by the Holy Spirit. And God is saying, these children belong to me. You are marked by God as his child. Glory to God. Glory to God. You are branded as a child of God that every demon and every angel can see. You are God's child. Praise God. And let's just continue on. We have a few minutes left. And let me just review something we've been talking a lot about from the beginning. Because the Holy Spirit, as we talked about the person of the Holy Spirit, and he is intelligent. And we saw that he um, he is the spirit of wisdom in Isaiah 11.2 the spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. And also we saw in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, actually verse 9 says, no mind, no eye has seen, no ear has, ear has heard, no heart has understood what God has re- planned for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit. So what does God reveal to us by his spirit? He reveals to us the plans of God. God reveals to us his plans for us by his spirit and the spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. That's first Corinthians two ten. And so the deep things of God, the Holy spirit knows, and he reveals them to us. So the Holy spirit reveals to us. Number one, the things of God. The plans of God, what God has prepared for those who love him and the deep things of God, the heart of God, the mind of God. And verse 12 in first Corinthians two twelve, we have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has really given us. So we can know the heart of God, the mind of God. And the plans and purposes of God revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Also, we know the things of the of Jesus Christ, the son. John 16, 
Verse 13 and 14, Jesus said, But when he, the truth, the, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. Verse 14 says, He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. So there we see the Holy Spirit reveals the Father to us. Also, the Holy Spirit reveals the Son, Jesus Christ, to us. Praise God. The Father and the Son. Praise the Lord. Now, we are out of time again today. And so let me just pray for you. Father, I pray that every person listening to me today is growing in their awareness of of the Holy Spirit to the person of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I pray and I ask that you guide and teach every single person who's listening today. Guide them and teach them in your perfect will and your perfect plan. Reveal to them the heart, the mind, and the plans of the Father and the heart and the mind of Jesus. And I thank you, Jesus. Seal them today in Jesus' name. Amen. So join me again tomorrow as we continue studying the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you. Remember, God loves you. You are blessed and highly favored by the Lord.